Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 17th meeting of 2020. Today we are taking evidence from the UK on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill, and we have two panels this morning. I'd like to welcome our first panel. We have joining us Professor Campbell Gemmell, visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde Law School and partner at Canopus Scotland Consulting. Professor Eloise Scotford from the University College London and Professor James Harrison from the University of Edinburgh. And uh, colleagues, throughout today, if there's anything that you want to um, join in on, if you, you're obviously someone's answering a question, but you would like to add to it, it would be very helpful to me if you could put an R in the chat box. But other than that, you don't have to do anything else on your computer screen as broadcasting will manage it all for you. So um, I'm going to ask the, an opening question on, on the continuity bill and it's um, how it might work with the, the internal proposed internal market bill in the UK. Um, so we're anticipating this UK internal market and how it could affect Scottish ministers' decision to use the keeping pace powers. And I just want to, before I, I come on to you, uh, draw your attention to what the Finance and Constitution Committee said about it in the report last week. And this is a quote from their recommendations uh, on that report. It says, it's unclear, especially in the absence of robust ever intergovernmental institutions, including effective dispute resolution mechanisms, what happens if agree agreement cannot be reached on harmonisation in specific policy areas? The committee's view that there is a real risk, therefore, that the regular, regulatory competencies of devolved nations will be challenged either because regula, regulatory standards are determined by UK legislation, particularly if necessary to comply with the UK's in, in, international obligations under new trade deals, or because legal challenges in UK courts seek to enforce market access principles. Um, this will have an impact um, on environmental considerations as well. So I, I wonder which of our panel would like to, to kick off with their view on both that from the Finance and Constitution Committee and my, my opening question about how the Internal Market Bill um, might cause tensions between the two governments. Um, other colleagues might be. Yeah, thank you. Other other <laughs> colleagues might be better place to, to lead off than I am. But I I think it's right to observe that it's difficult and that it's unclear, um, particularly at this point, given that OEP is not um, uh, finally specified, although it does seem uh, rather rather weak. Um, but the way in which the various um, regulatory inputs are finessed into an overall position is extremely hard to determine. Um, but given the long-term position where environment is more often uh, viewed as a potentially tradable element, um, I would be deeply concerned that the current arrangements are, are inadequate to protect um, the high qualities and standards expected in, in the Scottish environment. It, it, there do not appear to be um, sufficiently robust uh, protections in place, but it, but I say that in the absence of there being clarification, it's not as if there are explicit things that cause immediate concern. It's in fact the lack of detail from my perspective. Uh, James Harrison. Um, I mean, Campbell's perfectly right. It's very difficult to give clear answers as we don't have. A bill on, for the internal market yet? We just have the white paper with very vague indications about the, the kind of direction of travel. Um, I think the, the bigger picture is we're at a really pivotal moment for our constitution in the UK and, and the different ways in which uh, at various levels of actors will be able to operate independently of each other. Um, you know, we, we've left the EU at the end of this year, we'll be out of the implementation period. And uh, that means a fundamental layer that has kept this common standard across the UK, i.e. EU regulations and, and other measures, will have disappeared. And you know, there are arguments that something needs to be put in place. It's not simply a matter of not doing anything. 
the big question is how you design that and how you should ensure both um, some kind of compatibility between measures taken in, in Scotland and the rest of the UK, but also ensuring sufficient regulatory space for the Scottish Parliament and the ministers to act when it's appropriate to do so. I mean, in the EU, we have the principle of subsidiarity uh, and, and some kind of reflection of that principle within a new UK setup would be appropriate. Um, but I think it's also worth bearing in mind before the EU was given competence over the environment, many of its early environmental measures were taken under the single market provisions with a view to promoting access. So I think inevitably um, environment is going to be tangled up in these internal market discussions. And we really need a, a serious, robust conversation about what we want the future UK to look like. Because, of course, what I haven't mentioned is the whole keeping pace with U, uh, EU environmental standards that the Scottish Government have committed to, but that doesn't seem to have been echoed um, by, by, by anything else in, in the UK um, proposals so far, or am I wrong? My, oh, my view is, I mean, it seems that the, the UK government is um, proposing to take a different path to the EU. Um, and, and is less keen on keeping pace than um, Scotland is. Now, that's a policy choice. And I think in the future, the, the Scottish government is going to be faced with a policy choice because, of course, the, the provisions in the Continuity Bill allow the Scottish ministers to keep pace, but it doesn't require them to do so. So there's going to be political choices in the future about whether or not Scotland keeps pace with the EU, um, adopts similar standards to the rest of the UK, takes a completely different track. Um, I'll come to Eloise Scottford for her view on, on what I've just asked. Thank you, convener. I mean, I, I agree with um, Professor Harrison and the other witnesses. I just wanted to point out what is probably the obvious, which is if it does turn out that there's an in internal market um, bill or act for the United Kingdom, which replaces some of the function of the European Union in creating common standards, particularly in the environment field, that means the bill we're looking at today, certainly, um, part one is at high risk of incompatibility with that and therefore being struck down. When, when you say struck down, you mean the, continu well, the continuity bill? I mean, the I, 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 I think, it, again, as James is saying, we're kind of speculating. But if you end up with a, 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 an, an internal market bill that removes the discretion for the Scottish Government to keep pace, then these, this discretion will therefore it will, it will be redundant, but I think it will not be able to be exercised. Um, Mark Ruskell wanted to come in on that, Mark. I think that's pretty chilling, to be honest, um, you know, the, the prospects of the continuity bill being struck down. But I wanted to ask about whether you felt that there are particular areas where policies could be challenged under the the proposals in the white paper. I mean, the white paper mentions deposit return scheme uh, as being one area. I wondered if, if there are other areas which you think there might be um, divergence. I think a, a, a deposit return scheme is a classic internal market measure, certainly under EU law. Um, so that would be, I, I guess, appropriate with it within the scope of an internal market. Um, I, I mean, James is right. It, it, this becomes a matter of how the UK wants to design its own internal market. It may, it may decide that a lot more things fall into environmental competence that are, um, you know, and, and, and the, the, there is a good agreement between the devolved nations and the UK government about sharing that power and a good amount of subsidiarity. It might be that there is a lot of environmental matters that get caught up in an essentially set internal market um, kind of set of standards. And, and I think that's all to play for. It's just this having no clarity, it becomes very difficult to say with certainty that the kinds of discretions that the continuity bill gives for um, in a Scottish minister set to set um, or to bring in regulatory powers to keep pace with the EU. It's, it's great in principle, but it, it's not, it's, it, it, it is a, a matter of, of, of sequencing. It's bringing this in before it's, it's clear what the power, what, 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 what the discretion of the government potentially is to, 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 to keep pace. Um, I'm going to come back to James Harrison 
Member, the, the internal market principles that are being talked about in the white paper, uh, mutual recognition and non-discrimination, don't necessarily preclude each constituent part of the UK taking its own actions, um, but rather they um, restrict certain types of actions which prevents products, services from other parts of the UK accessing the market. So it doesn't necessarily preclude Scotland going down its own path, but it does restrict what can be done against products and services from other parts of the UK. So it may not be as extreme as striking down. I mean, you know, if, if we go down a route of internal market reforms where we have a single standard setting process across the UK, that could be the case, but it may not that be that extreme. But certainly there will be implications for um, you know, levelling the playing field, to use a phrase that comes from another context. Uh, in the UK internal market. And I guess why we've got a lot of these questions is because there hasn't been an awful lot of progress in common frameworks to this point. So this is why we still have a lot of question marks against, you know, how will the four governments interact with one another? Um, how will they, they reach sort of the agreements around this? Uh, any any kind of like divergence in, in, in policy or keeping pace versus you know what happens with any kind of trade deals would that be fair to say absolutely i mean it's terrifying that we're four months away from the end of the implementation period where eu law will no longer be uh, relevant although we still don't know that whether that's true actually because we don't know whether there will be an agreement looking incredibly unlikely uh, and so you know it's very uncertain there's not much time left to figure out the basic structures. I mean, we're not talking about substance here. We don't know about the basic structures that will be in place, and that's worrying. Campbell Gemmell. Intimately connected, the two different dimensions of, of the implications of seeking to keep pace um, and the nature of the internal market and the way in which regulatory arrangements work at work there raise a whole bunch of separate issues. And I, I think it's important to stress on the first one that clearly um, many of us would, would think that that does require hardening up from a, from a Scottish government's point of view, that it is a, a, an explicit commitment rather than simply something that seems desirable. Um, but I think, for example, water trading internally within uh, the UK market could become a very challenging issue if that results in the levelling down of standards uh, for, for water quality in Scotland, which would then have a whole series of follow-up uh, consequences as far as industrial use and, and drinking water quality, etc., were concerned. But there has been a long-term desire south of the border to, to uh, literally and metaphorically to tap into Scottish assets. So I, I think the, the pricing model and the way in which that currently works uh, could could be uh, seriously in, uh, at, at risk, and that's just one. Of, it's a very important one, but it's just one of a number of areas where a longer-term commitment to European standards would definitely help to secure, or at least to indicate, a desire to secure that that set of higher standards. I'm going to bring in Finlay Carson, who has a question on this thing. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, looking looking at the, the bill. We've had some concern from the likes of the NFU, who are concerned that it would lead to divergence between Scotland and, and the rest of the UK. But is there not also contained within the bill the potential for, for the Scottish Government ministers to have free reign to align Scotland with the EU without scrutiny, which could potentially uh, lead to uh, a, a division between the, the, the whole of the UK? Any of our panellists would like to come in on that? Just let me know. Um, James Harrison. I mean, it's worth noting that EU regulations have always been implemented separately by Scotland, uh, the rest of the UK. So there's always been potential for for small divergences, even in the implementation of EU directives, particularly. Um, so I think there's never been complete. Uh, similarities between um, EU law across all jurisdictions in the UK. So I think this is a threat that maybe is a little bit over-exaggerated. Um, there are going to be differences, and that's good. Um, I think the extent of those differences is a policy question at the end of the day, and, and it will be up to the um, government of the day to decide how to align itself. Uh, Claudia Beamish, you wanted to come in. 
on this before I go to Stuart Stevenson. You know, just very briefly, good morning to the panel and thank you for joining us. Um, could I just ask what the um, decision settlement, um, what the status of that might be in relation to the internal market discussion we're having and, and of course, the act that actually underpins the devolution settlement because this is enshrined in law and whether that has any relevance. Might be a very quick answer, <laughs> but um, I'd like to know the answer, please, from the panel. I don't know if everyone picked up on that because there was a little glitch as you started your question there, Claudia. Could you say what that was in reference to? Because just as you said what it was, there was a glitch. Right. The um, in re the devolution settlement and the acts that underpin that, whether that has a status in relation to the internal market and the and the the position of Scottish ministers and Scottish Parliament as we go forward. Thank you. Colleagues, would you, anyone want to come in there? James Harrison. If I remember these discussions correctly, and it, it seems like an age ago um, when we were talking about withdrawal act, but the, the powers of the Scottish Parliament were uh, Changed the restrictions relating to EU law were removed. Um, so I think the, the principle now is that everything that was previously EU matters are now devolved. But there is a regulation power I think that allows the UK to, um, in a sense, reserve particular matters that have been repatriated from the EU. If, if I remember correctly, that's how the um, discussions about the competence of the Scottish Parliament are ultimately resolved. So it would be possible for the uh, UK government to um, reserve certain aspects of repatriated EU law using this regulation power in the Scotland Act. Thank you. We're going to go around to some questions on, on this theme from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Convena. Um, since uh, we are talking here about uh, a context determined by common frameworks, um, can I just ask the academics uh, a very simple question about common frameworks? How frameworks are going to come into being at this stage? Do any of you know how they are going to come into being? Are they simply something that uh, a couple of ministers at Westminster are going to get together in a wee room, write something down and tell the rest of us that's it? Or is there a process that involves the other nations of the UK? Why, why, why uh, don't I invite Professor Gamble, Campbell, Campbell Gamble to say, if, I'm only asking if anyone's aware of uh, how it's going to happen. I am, def I, I am definitely not aware of a mechanism or model in place to do that, Stuart. I, it's, a, it's a very important uh, question, and clearly there's been a lot of uh, informal discussion, but the formal meetings uh, I, and the process, I'm unaware. And James Harrison? common frameworks, I don't think it's as simple as saying there's one way in which they will come into being. Some frameworks will be legislative. The Fisheries Bill going through the UK Parliament at the moment, in a sense, provides an example of creating a common framework in that sector, whereby you'll have a joint fisheries statement, which will be commonly agreed by all of the relevant administrations, and then fisheries management plans under that, which again will have the input. Um, there are provisions in the UK Environment Bill which also allow uh, common uh, regulation making powers, um, sometimes with the consent of Scottish ministers, sometimes in parallel. Um, so I think it's complicated and each common framework will differ depending on the, the sector concerned. I don't know whether Professor Scottford uh, has anything to add to that. Professor Scottford. I, I, I don't know the detail, and I, I, I suspect Professor Harrison is right that it's going to depend on the negotiation in each sector. Um, but what is interesting, I mean, I, I would have thought at the very least that this will be based on agreement. Once there's a clear sense of how much power the UK government has 
that's reserved and how much our dissolved, devolved administrations have over policy areas, that there will be an agreement, that the idea of common frameworks is that they're, they're based on agreement, they're not based on dicta. Um, one interesting thing to do, this, this is not an uncommon problem in, in countries that have devolved power over environmental issues. And you see variations of these kinds of agreements in different countries around the world. Australia is a good example. Canada has them as well. And they, they tend to come up in those countries. They've come up with a bespoke model of agreement that is then carries some constitutional authority and has some kind of, you know, it, they, they, they create a new um, kind of higher order agreement. So it'll be interesting to see what, what the UK does come up with, but I, I would have thought that it would, would be based on agreement, otherwise it's going to um, be, you know, a, a, not, not a common framework, it's going to be the exercise of the UK government's reserved power, and that's a different kind of instrument. Tambor Gilmore, you wanted to come in. I, I agree entirely with, with what Eloisa just said, but I, I think it's interesting to reflect on what happened uh, in, in the last year, where effectively the COAG arrangements within Australia were dissolved by the current Australian administration. Um, so it, it's pretty obvious that processes that have been designed in detail in some administrations to allow uh, component parts of, of the Australian Commonwealth to work together can also be overridden by a government of the day. So I, whilst I would absolutely hope that there is such an approach taken uh, for it to be by agreement. Um, it, that's not a guarantee, uh, and recent and current evidence would tend to suggest it's an area that we should be watching very carefully. I want to bring Finn Carson back in. I missed that Finn actually had a supplementary question on, on his theme. Finn, would you like to come back in and, and ask the panel? Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I, I maybe didn't uh, ask my question very well, but I, I think we've certainly heard from Professor Harris and Professor Scottford that these things are often done uh, through joint agreement or consent, and we've seen that in the efforts there is in the environmental bill. One of the issues appears to be it would appear there's a reluctance from both sides to get these common frameworks brought forward. Um, but my, my, my first question, and I, and I didn't quite get the answer, was if uh, this government uh, want to align with EU laws without scrutiny, wouldn't it, and as, as the Law Society have suggested, and I'll quote, that neither the UK nor Scottish governments and stakeholders would have the opportunity to influence those proposals or even become familiar with them? Is that not a risk for this bill? And who are you addressing that to, Finlay? Uh, well, uh, perhaps Professor, uh, Professor Harrison, I think, he, the, the, who answered it in the first instance. It's not so ne necessarily an issue with differences across the United Kingdom, because ultimately that's what we want through devolved settlements, and, 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 and quite likely there's uh, retained and devolved uh, issues that we deal with in, in different parliaments. But specifically, if we were to align the Scottish government was to align with the EU, uh, wouldn't that cause problems right across the United Kingdom because we would have very little influence of, or no influence over the direction the EU might want to take when we align to them? I guess there are, there are two, two answers to that one. Um, it's, so the, the, an analogy is made in the, in the policy memorandum under this bill um, to the, the powers that were had under the European Communities Act to implement EU law. And in a sense, there's, a, there's an attempt to say we, we need similar powers in the future. Uh, I think there's fundamental differences between uh, those powers under the European Communities Act, where the UK had been directly involved in the negotiation of those instruments. It was able to influence the development of EU law. Uh, and indeed, it had obligations to implement them within particular timeframes. None of that is going to be true um, from, well, we're already out of those decision-making processes, even though this year we have an obligation to implement. But certainly from 1st of January next year, um, it is going to be a choice of the Scottish Government to align itself, and it won't have had any chance to influence what the, the rules are. And I think that is a... Um, an interesting position to take. Obviously, there is a, 
a political undertone. It's quite explicit in the, the documents accompanying this that you know this is intended to help Scotland one day um, become a member of the European Union again and ensure that its laws are ready for that day in the future. Um, and that seems to be the policy of the current Scottish administration, and that's that's for them to decide. But certainly, we'll be implementing measures that have been decided by at that stage essentially a foreign legislature and that's is a rather unusual position to take i'm going to come to questions from angus mcdonald thank you um convener and good morning to the panel um i'd like to look at uh, the reciprocal and related proposals which are which are being proposed through the the uk environment bill uh, and I wonder if the panel um, would care to compare the, the UK government and Scottish government proposals, especially around whether there are areas where the UK Environment Bill is stronger uh, or better defined than the, the Scottish proposals. And if there are such areas, um, if you would care to discuss what the implications might be. If you'd like to indicate who would like to come in. Eloise Scotford. Um, this is a really difficult question. <laughs> I, um, do you mean, just, can I just clarify, stronger in the sense of stronger environmental protection? Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay, it, it is quite hard to unpack that. If we say on the, the UK English Bill that we're just talking about part one, which is the thing that we can ease, most easily compare with the Scottish Continuity Bill, because obviously the English Bill has lots of provisions relating to specific policy, er policy areas like air quality and so on. Um, but in terms of environmental governance, um, I think there is much in the Scottish Continuity Bill that's in fact stronger and it would be good probably to go through the things one at a time. Um, but one thing, for example, that is stronger, I think, in the UK English Bill, or two things, one is um, the definition of the, envir the, the environment, so to which a lot of the uh, then the consequences flow in terms of the compliance mechanisms um, and the retention of the integration principle. Now that then potentially gets filtered down in the way those principles then bind ministers in the UK English Bill, but um, nonetheless it is there and I think that is an important distinction. So I, I would probably start with those two things. Um, I, I think there is much in the mechanics that actually is stronger in the, in, in, in the continuity bill. Angus, are you quite happy with that? Yeah, is there any other contribution from the other members of the panel? James Harrison. I guess a broader point to make is, is the, the interesting decision to frame the Scottish Bill as a, a continuity bill is the emphasis here is on you know, filling gaps left um, by the departure from the EU. Uh, and that, in a sense, gives the whole rationale for, for the proposals in the Scottish Bill, whereas uh, the UK Bill, they've decided to take a slightly different tack and, and they are addressing environmental governance much more broadly, not just the institutions, um, but you know, there's some great things in there about environmental targets um, and long-term environmental plans. And so they've, they've thought about environmental governance in the round and you know from an environmental law perspective it, it would have been nice to see some of that broader thinking um in scotland we've got a environment strategy for scotland but it's completely non-statutory at the moment there was an opportunity here to perhaps give that a statutory underpinning um we've got climate targets in scotland would it be useful to have other environmental targets as we're going to see um south of the border so i i think there's a there's a strategic choice of here about the framing of the bill, which actually makes them very difficult to compare. Professor Scottford, do you want to come back in? Point that's quite obvious. I mean, James is quite right about the points about um, environment improvement plans, which I think are strong. The target setting provisions, I think uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about them. They are a mixed bag. They're there. There's good stuff and there's bad stuff. 
Um, but I just wanted to point out the obvious point that in the, um, the, the, the latest revision of the, the UK English bill, that um, the OEP has now has power over climate targets. Uh, and so that is the, a, a, a big difference to the continuity bill. I think. And Professor Gemmell. This is um, sort of apples and oranges. They're clearly um, being designed for for the two different uh, domains, and there there is a, a, a scope for some cherry picking back and forth between between the territories. I, I think the issues about climate. Um, I'm glad that that um, uh, Louis raised that because I think that is a, uh, an important distinction and something that is clearly lacking uh, in the current um, Scottish proposals. But I, I think the way in which um, the regulatory oversight actually will work um, can automatically be concluded from what has been described. I think overall uh, there are there is some very uh, encouraging breadth, as it were, to the to the English proposals, but how they are operationalised is not yet completely clear. Um, I think the the way in which um, improvement plan type thinking is is applied is encouraging, and depending on exactly how ESS develops in Scotland. I think it would take us down an interesting path, which we may be going to, to move on to in terms of the difference between uh, high, higher level strategic uh, uh, analysis of, of um, policy and practice uh, and what happens around individual cases and individual uh, claims and complaints. So I think, I think it's, as always, it's helpful to look across the border to see where there is anything that might be beneficially ad adopted uh, into any revision of, of Scottish position. Um, but they're, they're, they highlight, in a sense, the continuing divergence of, of paths and therefore the tailoring to that particular context. I want to move on to talk about environmental principles, but before we do, Stuart, you, Stuart Stevenson, that's short supplementary. Could you tell us who it's addressed to as well? Uh, well, it's not anyone in particular, and it, but it is short, uh, Kimbina. Uh, we've twice heard that uh, the intention is to adopt the EU uh, bill into Scottish law without scrutiny. We've twice heard that. Um, I'm reading the bill. I have it in front of me. Scottish ministers may, by regulation, and the Parliament equally, it seems, if I read it correctly, may reject those regulations. So there is a scrutiny process, and I just wanted to mimic uh, the opportunity to to tell me that uh, there there is or is not an opportunity for scrutiny in the way the bill uh, is drafted. I don't know if anyone wants to come in on that, or it's probably self-evident. What, what Stuart's getting at there, um, James Harrison. Yeah. Stuart is, a, of course, right. There is opportunity for scrutiny. Um, usually, I think the negative procedure, but uh, for some matters, the affirmative procedure for regulation is laid. Um, but that opportunity is there. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark Russell is going to kick us off talking about environmental principles. Mark. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I'm just looking at copy here, Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. I've got this little souvenir copy here. But it says Article 37, Environmental Protection, a high level of environmental protection and the improvement of the quality of the environment must be integrated into the policies of the Union and ensured in accordance with the principle of sustainable development. It does appear that neither of those three principles are included within this bill. Um, although we were reassured by the bill team last week that, that the bill is written in a way that ensures policy integration. So I just wondered if, if we could just get your, your reflections on those missing principles, but also uh, any reflections on the principles that, that are in there, or what the, what the implications might be of, of missing certain principles out in practical terms. Professor Scottford. Thank you, convener, and thank you for the question. I think it's a very good question. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about these principles in the EU treaties. Um, finding them in the Charter is, is one place they also exist in the EU treaties. Um, I think the lack of an objective in this bill, and similarly in the English bill, on a high, have indicating that a high level of protection drives environmental governance and supports the environmental principles, 
is an oversight that's quite glaring and it's particularly glaring in the continuity bill because it it states in clause 93 that these um, principles are derived from section 1912 which contains the high level of protection commitment. Now, environmental principles are quite flexible and open-ended uh, notions of environmental protection. They're policy ideas. They can be applied in slightly stronger or slightly weaker ways. So there is distinct advantage in terms of setting a commitment to a high level of environmental protection to say that explicitly. Um, on the point of in the integration principle, um, I take the point of the government officials about the construction of the Act, meaning that the principles should be taken or regard must be had to the principles across different policy making areas. But I'm not sure that fully answers the, the challenge of including something like the integration principle. And the reason why is if you look at the TFEU, so the, the um, Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, it has an integration principle to uh, integrate environmental protection requirements across all policy making in the European Union. It puts it up front in Article 11. This integration principle has had this history of creeping up from just being within environmental competence to covering all aspects of EU policy making and also becoming stronger in the formulation. So the integration principle in Article 11 says that environmental protection requirements must be integrated into the definition and implementation of the union's policies and activities. So that is a higher duty, a stronger duty than having regard to these principles. So the integration principle in the EU sense puts a stronger and higher order obligation on the integration of environmental protection requirements. And there are a series of these integration type principles in the EU treaties and the environmental protection one is the most mandatory and the highest order in terms of the obligation it sets to that there must be an integration of environmental protection. So it adds a stronger commitment. Back to you, Mark. Um, I'm just interested if there's other other reflections on um, on the principles. If you want to use the chat box, if you want to contribute, colleagues. James Harrison. I mean, I think uh, Professor Scottford has given a a really good uh, answer there and I'd agree with everything she says she is the expert on the principles so uh, I fully fully agree with everything I mean the bill team I think uh, last week pointed to clause 12 in terms of the uh, purpose of the duties to explain uh, both why they hadn't included a high level of protection and why they hadn't included sustainable development as a principle and clause 12 does does refer to contributing to sustainable development it does refer to the purpose being protecting and improving, but that is different to saying there must be a high level of protection. So I would completely concur with Professor Scottford that um, there is something missing here. If the point is continuity, and that's how the, the Scottish Government has chosen to frame this bill, the point is continuity with um, the EU approach, it would seem to be um, lacking. Professor Gemmell. Exactly the supplement that I wanted to make. I completely agree with what both, both colleagues have said. I think the full set, <clears throat> excuse me, the full set should be present. Um, and I think there needs to be additional clarity on exactly how um, Scottish ministers would actually take the, the, the various elements forward and the extent to which they do become duties rather than uh, merely lip service areas. And James Harrison wants to come back in. I think the duty to have regard to the principles, um, uh, which as Professor Scottford has said, they are derived from equivalent principles provided for in the, the European treaties. I think that has to be read uh, alongside the duty to have regard to the, the guidance adopted by the Scottish ministers, and that guidance can include how those principles should be interpreted. And it doesn't necessarily require the Scottish ministers to, to follow in detail the prescriptions of the European courts, for example. They have to have regard to those interpretations, but they can adopt their own view. So in a sense, I, I think the guidance that's developed by the Scottish ministers is going to be critical to really understanding uh, 
um, what the impact of these principles will be in practice. Mark, back to you. You want to ask another question? Yeah, um, just just briefly, because uh, our time is, is marching on, but I just wondered if you believe this bill is compliant with the requirements under the Aarhus Convention. Who would like to take that? We'll go back to James Harrison. I didn't realize smiling counts as one thing to answer the question. Um, this is not going to do any harm to our prospects for complying with the Aarhus Convention. Whether it brings us into full compliance is, I think, is a separate question. Okay. Um, Eloise Scottford, did you want to come in on that? Just very briefly to say that I think I agree with James, it doesn't do any harm, but it's certainly not aiding the cause. It's not really doing anything particularly um, to improve compliance. I do think the um, excluding disclosure of or access to information in Clause 39.2 from the definition of environmental law is strange. A similar things in the English Bill, um, also strange. Um, I, I, I can... I guess there are some reasons for it, but it's strange in the environmental law context because access to environmental information is one of the three pillars of the Aarhus Convention, and not having this as a mechanism to ensure to have compliance with with that component of the Aarhus Convention, that a big uh, aspect of environmental law, does seem odd. Um, Thank you. Uh, Mark, are you happy to move on? Can I come to Claudia now? Claudia, you have um, questions around the principles. Claudia. Yeah, thank you, Lena. Um, I've got um, two questions, and I, I've, I'll ask them both at once in terms of the, the um, shortness of time, the, if the panel's okay with that. The first is... Um, in relation specifically to the principles um, and what they are. And I just wanted to highlight what the Faculty of Ag Advocates had said, um, that the principles make no mention of environmental equity in a redistributive sense and of human rights, um, and, and also um, the protection of human health um, and equity. And I, and I wondered if there was any comment on, on that, um, because I think that's enshrined in EU law as I understand it. So that, that's the first question. And the second one is we have touched on this already, but it's about the um, the the, um, the exploration of the implications of the duty to have regard to rather than a requirement to act in accordance with the principles. If we could explore that a, a bit further. There were quite a lot of submissions about that, which I won't go into now. Um, but um, if we could explore that further. So it's the additional principles I've highlighted, and also the having regard to or um, in accordance um, to act, act in accordance with. Thank you. Okay, um, time is running away from us, so I, I wonder if we can have one panel member and maybe maybe um, answer Claudia's question because we have quite a number of things to to cover before half past ten. Um, someone would like to come in on that? Ellie Scottford. Thank you, Convener. Um, very quickly uh, on those extra principles, uh, equity is, I mean, I said this in my written evidence, it's a political choice what kind of principles the Scottish Government wants to include and sign up to. And I think you make the case politically for whether equity should be in there or not. Um, not a strong principle in EU in terms of its, how it's being constitutionalised, but um, on human health, quite interesting, and I note this in my evidence, that the precautionary principle is um, referred to as the precautionary principle as regards the environment in the bill, which I find odd because in EU law and EU policy, the precautionary principle very much extends to human health. And that might be something to reflect on. Um, I put a few notes about that in my written evidence. Uh, human rights, I think, are a different bag. They're not principles. They're legal. They're legal, legally enforceable rights if you want to construct them and create them and defend them. And I think it's a conceptually different thing. Um, the have regard to duty, I agree, is weak. 
the uh, English uh, bill was challenged on this, it has upgraded the duty to have due regard to. So that might be that's a, a point on which the English bill is stronger. Um, that's still not that strong. So it could be stronger if you really wanted to uh, embed these principles in policy making. It could go further. It could be taken into account. It must be integrated or, or, or what have you, but there are alternative formulations. Well, it's just a, just in the interest of time, we do have um, a lot of questions around the, the purpose of the bill and the uh, proposed environmental standards, um, uh, what well, the ESS. Can I move our panel on to talking about that? We have some questions from Angus MacDonald, and if we have time, we'll come back to some of the things that we might have missed around the environmental principles, but we are worried about time. Angus. Okay, um, thanks, Kamina. Uh, with regard to the purpose of the bill, um, I'd be keen to hear the, the, the panel's um, view. Um, basically, would, would the panel say that the bill, through the proposed ESS, uh, provides for a continuity of governance after Brexit? Uh, and if not, where would, uh, where would be the gaps? Uh, and also, are the bill's proposals and the ESS model the most effective solution? Great. Right, we come to Professor Gemmel. Thank you. Um, to a degree, <laughs> um, I think the uh, the commitments are positive and and well received. But I think the weaknesses, as as constructed at this point, are of concern. Um, the fact, as I said in my submission, that that um, various mechanisms are are included is is good. But the way in which um, Improvement reports and, and plans can be deployed uh, is definitely a, a, a weakness. It does not have the, the robustness that, that is desirable. And to, to answer explicitly the question, no, it's not um, uh, an, an adequate or a, a, a fully sufficient um, uh, substitute for the arrangements at present. As I pointed out in the, in the link uh, report at, at some length. I, I think it's absolutely essential to view the existing arrangements as a as a fairly complex system of checks and balances and components. And this is a, a focus on really looking at the commission type element of the system without actually doing anything either to existing governance in other parts of the system or to the uh, by the inclusion of a of a dedicated environment court. Um, and if we then focus down on the fact that it's specifically the Commission element, it does not have the robustness. It does not pursue, for example, to the level of an individual case at this point. It only looks at, as it were, the, the, the more general um, and more strategic. And that's a very big gap. And the argumentation around that seems to be largely that we're, we're all terribly fearful of, of being overwhelmed by a large number of cases. Um, well, if there are a large number of failures in the system, then perhaps there should be a large number of cases. But the, the experience, both uh, through the existing Commission model and indeed in other jurisdictions where similar arrangements apply, suggests that by proper triage and dedicated advice and support in advance, that can be winnowed down very quickly to a, a number of, of priority cases. So I think it, it's, it's a good step, but it's at the moment um, Flawed in a number of uh, a number of ways. So that that would be my overall comment. Happy to happy to uh, come back on any details if required. Professor Harrison. In some ways, this goes beyond what the Commission could do. I mean, the Commission procedures apply to uh, compliance with EU environmental law, and you know this applies to any Scottish environmental law. And I think that's to be welcomed that. And we've, we're finally getting some robust uh, compliance mechanisms that don't rely upon uh, judicial review uh, in order to ensure that our public authorities are complying with all forms of environmental law. Um, I would agree with uh, Professor Gamble's comments about the, the, the larger system. It kind of echoes a little bit what I was saying earlier. I, I think the, the body probably has roughly the right set of powers. I think what's going to be critical is how it decides to use them. And I think the strategy is going to be really important. I'm not, I'm not sure I entirely agree that individual cases will be out with the remit of the, of the new body. Certainly, the, the formal enforcement powers relating to improvement reports and 
um, the the compliance decisions notices um, can't be used in individual cases. But if you look at the practice of the European Commission, a lot of what they've done in terms of resolving complaints about environmental law has been very informal. Uh, it's not relied upon form, formal going to court and, and um, decisions, that things can be resolved. And I think there's an emphasis uh, in the schedule dealing with the, the, the strategy to try and have a similar system whereby things should be resolved as quickly and effectively as possible without necessarily having to rely upon the hard-hitting powers that are contained in the body of the bill. And I think it would be very interesting to see how Environmental Standards Scotland develops its strategy, develops its priorities for looking at different types of complaints. It's going to have to do all of those things. Uh, and so the devil will be in the detail, really. Professor Scotford. Thank you, convener. Um, just to add, I think I think I, I, I agree with m pretty much all that, but I think I think there's something about the definition of a failure to comply with environmental law mixed with the use of improvement plans that means that really big systemic breaches in environmental standards might not be subject to the enforcement of ESS. And why I'm saying that is if you look at the, the definition of the failure to comply with environmental law, which they've done in the English Bill as well, and I find I find just conceptually really odd that you define what a failure of the law is, because a failure of the law is to comply with the law is a failure to comply with the law. But there you have it. There are some good things about this definition in that it potentially brings in a, broad, a broader sweep of authorities that might have contributed to a failure to comply with environmental law. But in the way that it's defined, it might be that public authorities have taken um, all the actions that they might reasonably take to achieve compliance, for example, with water quality standards, air quality standards, but nonetheless, those standards have not been attained. Under EU law, there would still be a compliance mechanism. There would still be an enforcement mechanism to ratchet up the pressure to achieve those standards. And I don't think the, defin the definition of failure to comply with environmental law captures that kind of case, the ultimate failure to achieve standards where there has been best efforts. Um, in addition, if you look at the compliance notice power, and what is great about the compliance notice power is that there is a sanction for failing to comply with a compliance notice, which the English Bill does not have. So this is a strong provision, but the, it can't be issued where an improvement um, uh, report has been issued, which seems to be the case where it's a strategic or more complex case, uh, for example, where there's more than one public authority involved. Um, I mean, I noticed the evidence last week of the government officials indicated that the improvement report route was only where the law needed to be improved, but it in fact also applies to compliance, to failures to meet environmental law. So if, if that route is chosen, the compliance route, the compliance notice route is knocked out. Um, and I worry that what happens is that complex questions of compliance with environmental standards and environmental issues like water quality, air quality, are often very complex to resolve, require different government departments to work together and so on, might go down the improvement report route, not be fully resolved and therefore not have an ultimate compliance notice route to try and bring them into compliance if the failure of environmental law definition actually captures the case in ultimately not attaining standards. I'm going to come to Claudia Beamish because we have a question around the independence of the ESS and uh, I know that Campbell Gemmell wants to come back in on that so I'll, I'll bring you back in but if we can take Claudia's question please. Right thank you convener um, and uh, we, we touched on this we discussed this with the bill team last week whether the, the um, ESS will be sufficiently independent and resource to deliver its environmental governance functions. Um, in particular um, as we, as a committee highlighted last week, um, and we appreciate your answers on this from the panel, is um, is the appointments process for an interim body and then the permanent ESS board and the first chief executive confirmation by, um, with the nomination by Scottish ministers appropriate? How do you see 
Um, how do you see that developing? Thank you. I wonder if I can bring in Professor Gemmo and you can maybe make your point you wanted to make and maybe pick up on what Claudia has just asked there. But I'll keep an eye in the chat box for other contributors. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, I, the, the the point I was going to make, other than agreeing with uh, Professor Scottford, was really that there is, uh, I think, um, an issue around the fact that we, although we're moving very quickly at the moment, we're also moving rather late. Uh, and so my hope is that there will be considerable flexibility over the final specification of of um, the duties before statutory uh, status is reached. Um, because I think there is quite a lot to work through here, including issues around um, case typology and the ways in which the individual uh, issues might be handled, the difference between a complaint and a more egregious failure to comply with, with uh, the highest element of the law. So I think there are a number of things that need to be worked through there. Um, as I set out in, in uh, both of the reports that I was involved in, I, I think the independence of the body and the nature of it, as I recommended as a parliamentary commission, would certainly require uh, ministers not to be directly involved in, in those specifics of, of recruitment and engagement. I think that gives a much clearer um, locus to the body as being uh, genuinely independent, but empowered on a cross-party parliamentary um, uh, basis. Um, clearly, any arrangements can be made to work. and. I, I, the provisional level to get the body established, I don't think, as long as there is a transparent process, I don't think that ministers appointing is necessarily a, a fundamental flaw. But I think it raises interesting questions about that, that power locus in the longer term. And I, I continue to believe that there should be a genuinely independent and, and parliamentary locus for the body rather than, than a governmental one, or any perception that there is a governmental one. And would anyone else like to come in, particularly on, on Claudia's point? No. Can we move on? Uh, Angus, you have a question around um, gaps in terms of, of uh, powers. Yeah. Um... If you'd like me to, to pursue that just now, the, the committee um, obviously has uh, pursued the issue of uh, what the Law Society of Scotland has referred to as a, a potential uh, lacuna in environmental governance, and that an action Scottish ministers take using an executive devolved power in a reserved policy area would be excluded from the remit of the ESS. Uh, whilst UK ministers exercising powers in devolved competence would be excluded from the remit of the OEP. So, um, I'd be interested to hear what the, the panel think of what issues may arise if UK ministers exercising powers and devolved competence, and Scottish ministers exercising executive powers and reserve competence, are out with the remits of both the OEP and the ESS. Anyone? Professor Gemmel? Professor Gemmel. Thank you. Um, I, again, I think other colleagues probably feel as, as um, cheery as I do about, about entering into that space. I, I think um, it, it, it's an area that clearly needs to be worked through. And once we know finally what OEP looks like, I think that will help. Um, Getting involved in, in devolved or non-devolved territory at the other end of the jurisdiction is clearly uh, potentially a challenge. I don't have any particular um, uh, clever observations to make, other than that there there should not be gaps uh, if we're to make this work properly. It's a complex set of arrangements now, and it will be in future. Uh, when it comes to the oversight capability of ESS, I think anything that relates to policy and practice in Scotland should be in scope. Um, but achieving that, given the, the nature of reserved arrangements and potential changes in that, makes it very difficult to be definitive about it. But it would seem odd to be the subject of, of uh, re uh, environment policy, but not actually to be able to influence or, or oversee it. So. Uh, I think I think that's that's to be determined and and not straightforward. 
Um, James Harrison. We have an issue with your microphone. Um, it back on that's now? it. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the only thing to add to that is clearly these these bodies are going to have to work together. I think from a from a citizen's perspective, we we really require a smooth, seamless um, process. And you know, if if a, an individual makes a complaint to ESS that doesn't happen to be within ESS's remit, then you would hope that it could then forward that to the OEP and make sure that it is resolved. And we wouldn't want you know to make this too complicated to actually operate from a layperson's perspective. We have one, one final question from Mark Ruskell, and then we, we have actually run out of time. Mark, could you want to go back to some of the issues um, that you raised earlier in the meeting? So, final question, if you see yeah. a colleague who wants to That's answer in the chat. Perhaps just a wrap-up question about the, the scope of the bill. It's quite tightly linked to the provisions of strategic environmental assessment plans and programmes. Um, it's linked to particular public bodies, um, and it does have some exclusions around budgets, for example. So I wonder if you had any any final thoughts on that, on the scope of the bill. Is it is it correctly sort of drafted in terms of its scope, or do you see the potential for um, the scope to be to be broadened? Um, and and any thoughts you have on exclusions? Professor Scottford wanted to come in. Written um, some detailed paragraphs on this, but I, I would just say that the scope is broader than the English Bill and is to be welcomed in that respect that it actually applies to public authorities other than ministers. Um, certainly, in terms of the, um, the policy making power based on principles, um, I, I think the linking to the strategic policy making power through the link to the um, Environmental Assessment Act is actually very neat and quite elegant. Um, but where there is the, the, the downside to that, however, is huge legislative complexity. Now, we're going to have that anyway, because that's what leaving the European Union does, but it just adds a bit more um, obscurity in the legislative landscape to understand what the scope of the bill actually is. Um, but there is one thing that could be extended and is something that you might to consider, which I've, I've put in my written evidence, is that whether, certainly for principles, their roles should extend to all decision making that they're relevant to by public authorities, um, and there are there are there are reasons for that that are good, and there are other reasons. Um, I think that the the kinds of reasons why you would do that, and I think the EU principles tend to work in that kind of way more, um, is that it would capture things like very large planning applications, um, but there are other reasons where you wouldn't do it in that it might create uh, a lot of complexity. So um, I, I, I leave you with those thoughts. On finance, I think the, the debate is raging there about whether you want to green your budgets and use this as a mechanism for doing that, have a more kind of green approach to budget setting. That's a political kind of argument to make, I think. If, if no other panellists want to come in on that, I'm actually going to round off this particular uh, session. Um, with our panel. I want to thank the panellists very much for coming in this morning. An awful lot to be discussed, probably not enough time to, 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 to go through absolutely everything, but your evidence has been very helpful. I'm going to suspend this meeting to allow the panels to change over. Welcome back. Uh, we continue taking evidence on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill. and I'd like to welcome our second panel this morning. Isabel Mercer from the Governance Group at Scottish Environment Link, Alison McNabb, Policy Executive of the Law Society of Scotland, and Dr Vivian Gravy from uh, Queen's University Belfast on uh, behalf of the Brexit and Environment Network. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, making an assumption that you have been listening in on the evidence from our, our first panel as well, and we're going to be covering similar themes with, with yourselves. Um, and I think my initial question was, was around some of the concerns that have been raised by the, the Finance and Constitution Committee here and been raised by yourselves in your submission around the issues with the, the desire to keep pace with environmental standards and laws of the EU by the Scottish Government, 
but the emerging um, internal market um, bill from the UK and possibly a lack of compatibility with those, those um, two pieces of legislation. Um, again, with with the panel members, if you want to indicate in, in the chat box whether or not you want to to come in on that, but that's certainly a, a, an initial theme about your thoughts on, on, on that that I just outlined. Uh, Dr Vivian Gravy. Hello. Hi. I don't necessarily see this as an incompatibility. The problem is more that if you have the uh, internal market uh, as as promised in the white paper, what you would have is you know the ability of Scotland to uh, keep pace with EU rules and to adopt more ambitious rules, and then UK products, um, like English like rest of UK product, English or Welsh, for example, not following these rules being available in Scottish shops, and then issues for you know, Scottish uh, businesses perhaps held to higher standards than their Welsh or English competitors. So it would be more that it is perfectly possible to do to do that, but then that will come at a very high, potentially high economical cost. And then there's a question of you know you would be pitting high environmental ambition against you know business competitiveness. Which, especially in terms of COVID recovery, would be a very problematic method to send. The other aspect of that is, of course, that while the Scottish government wants to keep pace, Northern Ireland will have to keep pace in some of these areas, and that's something that is really not taken well into account in the internal market proposal. So what you have there is you could have actually, you know, Wales potentially, Scotland and Northern Ireland keeping pace with EU rules, whether by you know, political will or because of the protocol, and then England being the only part of the UK actually diverging from it. And that may lead to different economical you know, um, consequences for this. But in any case, we have to remember England being the much bigger market, you will still have that pressure and you will still have that issue with English products potentially undercutting Scottish products in Scottish shops. Alison McNabb. Thank you, convener. Um, I think Dr. Gravy has, has raised some interesting points around the, <clears throat> the practicalities involved in the, the internal market arrangements. We, of course, at this stage only have the white paper, um, and it will remain to be seen as to, to what um, any inter internal market bill um, brings forward. I think what can be said is that the internal market provisions, whatever they may, may look like in due course, but also um, the development of common frameworks work, which has, has been ongoing, and future trade and, and other international agreements will impact upon um, how the, the keeping pace powers can be used by, by the Scottish Government. The bill, of course, um, provides for that, I suppose, in that it is um, a, a power that they may introduce regulations. It is not a, a requirement to do so, and of course, no um, requirement to, to maintain or, or exceed um, EU provisions in relation to environmental standards. So, um, I, I think really the, the answer here is we need to wait and see to some extent, um, but the, the continuity bill provides some degree of flexibility to accommodate whatever the, the arrangements may be. Isabel Mercer. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I think these are excellent questions, and I think all the panellists so far this morning have made some very interesting points about this topic. I would, I would reiterate that uh, Alison's point she's just made, that this is kind of a, a, a system of many moving parts and uncertainties at the moment, and without actually seeing what is in the bill, it's quite difficult to comment on some of the provisions. Uh, Scottish Environment Link obviously being concerned mainly with what the environmental outcomes of all these proposals will be, is most interested to ensure that with the internal market, there's a kind of shared set of common standards that ensure there's no race to the bottom across the UK countries, but also that there's no cap on the ambition and ability of any of the devolved administrations to go above and beyond those requirements um, where they choose to do so. And then so we come to the point of how does that interact with the continuity bill and the keeping pace provisions. And from a from a Scottish Environment Link perspective, we, we hugely welcome the kind of ambition to keep pace and, and have this kind of dynamic alignment with 
EU standards, we would like to see the bill go further and actually have a firmer commitment to some sort of non-regression of environmental standards, whether that's some kind of formulation to ensure that those keeping pace powers are actually used in order to achieve high environmental outcomes, maybe through some kind of overarching purpose for the powers. Um, and so I think, again, these are there's a lot of unanswered questions, but in the midst of all that uncertainty, I think we feel it would be excellent if this bill could put the um, the ambition that we've seen to align with EU standards in an even firmer sense, so that it will achieve that high level of environmental protection. And actually, providing like real clarity about ambition from a Scotland perspective in this bill just now would really help to do that. I'm going to bring um, uh, Dr. Gaby back in. Thank you. I think um, I mean the UK internal market white paper has to really be compared to what we know already about the EU internal market and how it works. And what we have there is, of course, there is the ability in the EU internal market to go beyond common environmental rules. Every part of the UK has been able to go beyond uh, common EU rules before. And it's actually quite funny, if you look at it, that uh, in the UK internal white paper, um, the UK government speaks about being very ambitious on plastics, when we know actually that Wales and Scotland have been more ambitious than central UK government on plastics, using these same provisions in EU law. So what we have already is that we had these uh, principles of non-discrimination um, and mutual recognition in the EU context, but you could always go beyond them uh, to pursue objectives of public health, of environmental ambition. And we do not have similar strong environmental exemptions to these principles in the UK uh, white paper proposals. And that's where there's lots of tensions around, yes, on paper, you may be able to continue to be very ambitious, but it will cost you, whereas in the EU context, it does not cost you currently. So, Dr. Kirby, in, in the background of this, and this was mentioned by the Finance and Constitution Committee's report, is the, the prospect of uh, trade agreements perhaps um, could influence environmental standards thresholds uh, across all the devolved nations. I mean, how, where does that fit in with your thoughts there? Well, I wouldn't say across all, because I think Northern Ireland would be protected uh, from uh, any down uh, because of the protocol, at least on, on these aspects of environmental law or animal welfare that is covered in the protocol. It doesn't cover all of environmental policy. Um, but yes, I mean, that is, you know, it is definitely regulatory alignment or disalignment with the EU is one of the aim of Brexit and it, part of it is to be able to do things differently and the, one of the drivers for doing things differently is striking trade deals and moving closer to perhaps the American ways of doing things and regulating things. So it's definitely part of, um, part of the picture and I think something that comes very clearly from for example, the Scottish government response to the UK internal market white paper is this is not about just this government. These are rules about that future UK governments and future Scottish governments will have to deal with for the like, foreseeable future. So even if we have political commitments from this government not to downgrade certain standards, this, these rules would still allow that. Um, and a future government will not be bound by these same commitments. Thank you. Will you bring in Frank Carson? Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I think it's important that, that, that we will look at the, the white paper. However, this, this session is, is really about uh, the continuity bill Scotland, so we, we need to look and scrutinise potential issues within that. Um, you know, you've, we've touched on the principles of uh, mutual recognition or whatever, but my concern is that potentially, uh, with keeping pace powers, that uh, there would be a lack of scrutiny. Now, I know uh, my colleague Stuart Stevenson suggested that there was the ability for the, the Scottish Parliament to reject or accept uh, conditions, but it does not actually give us the ability to influence those uh, policies that may come down from um, the EU if we are to keep pace. And, and we have heard in, in the written submission from the, uh, the, uh, the, the Law Society of Scotland, and they highlighted that neither the UK nor the Scottish Government 
could uh, uh, have the opportunity to, to influence uh, proposals uh, or become familiar with them before they were put in place. So, uh, can I hear what uh, the thoughts are with regards to the, the direction that the, the Scottish uh, Government are moving, and that would be to align far more closely to the EU than potentially with, with the UK and the issues that might come uh, with regards to, to legislation that we are unable to, to influence? Alison McNabb wants to come in on that. Thank you, convener. Um, I think I think the the question raises some interesting issues. Um, policy divergence, of course, is a is a natural consequence of devolution, and uh, there are already examples of policy divergence within environmental matters um, within the EU, within the UK rather. Um, so I suppose that sets something of a of a backdrop for this. It is, um, however. Recognise that the the powers in the bill, as I as I referred to earlier, are discretionary as such. So it is within the the Scottish government's gift as to to whether to align with the EU or not. Um, there are some benefits of that. There may of course be um, EU provisions coming forward where the Scottish government take the the view that they do not wish to to align with those and um, may be better aligning with, with um, other UK jurisdictions. In terms of the scrutiny point, um, uh, the bill, the keeping pace powers in the bill are very wide um, secondary legislative powers. Um, it is the Law Society's view that those powers are inappropriate unless um, there is some overriding justification. And even then, there are opportunities for enhanced scrutiny. I think reference was made in the earlier panel this morning to the, the almost default position, which is um, by way of the, the negative um, procedure for scrutiny, other than in some cases in which, um, which scenario there will be affirmative procedure used. But there are opportunities to strengthen that, um, for example, reversing that almost affirmative procedure, except in, in some minor circumstances, or even the super affirmative procedure. And I think, in fact, the, the earlier legal continuity bill provided for the, the super affirmative procedure. So that's certainly um, worth some further consideration. Isabel Mercer. Thanks, convener. Yeah, so building on some of Alison's points, actually, I think a lot of this comes back to the question of the aim of the powers and going kind of beyond just thinking about the aim to uh, remain dynamically aligned with EU law, what is the outcome that's trying to be achieved? Which comes back to my earlier point that if the bill was more clear about um, those powers being used to achieve a high level of environmental protection, that would in fact help to clarify. And, and coming back to the scrutiny powers, Link is concerned that as the way the powers are currently drafted, then potentially regressive changes to environmental law could be made through the negative procedure. Because, for instance, if at the moment the EU were hypothetically to pass a piece of legislation that did represent a regression in environmental standards, and these powers were used to then match Scots law to that, then um, that could be done potentially through the negative procedure without, with limited scrutiny from Parliament. Whereas, if the powers more clearly stated in the bill for use or high high level of environmental protection, then that would resolve some of those issues from our point of view. Vivian Gravy. Yes, I'd just like to come uh, come back in on just one point, which is uh, not being really aware of what EU law would be coming into effect. Now, of course, I mean the EU legislative process is quite transparent, and also it takes quite a bit of time. So I don't think that you would end up in a situation where directives happen, like, you know, happen overnight, and then the Scottish government would keep pace with it overnight either. So there is definitely the possibility uh, for the Scottish Parliament to work in terms of committees to kind of also, you know, have some kind of, you know, surveillance of just what's happening in Brussels. If you are interested in what could, what the government may want to keep pace with, or if you want to influence what the government decides to keep pace with, then it is in the gift of the member of the Scottish Parliament to set up a committee and to look at what is happening in Brussels. And in any case, I think it is really important to remember that you know, the UK, all parts of the UK have played a huge role in developing EU environmental rules as it is. 
So it's, it is very unlikely you're going to have radical shifts in the way the EU does environmental policy. And then it's more of a question of what you would be keeping pace with is the latest update on a policy that you have played a key role in developing. And where, whereas, of course, formal UK government um, like ways of influencing EU decision making will be gone, there will still be informal ways and also informal ways for non-governmental actors, environmental NGOs, um, you know, think tanks and all that, that have played, uh, UK environmental NGOs, that have played a huge role in designing um, EU environmental rules. So I don't think it's, yes, it will be, you, you know, we are outside of the European Union. That does not mean that there will be no UK voices influencing the shaping of, uh, of EU rules after Brexit. Uh, Stu Stevenson, you wanted to um, ask a supplementary on this. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Convita. It was just to go back to uh, Isabel Mercer in particular on scrutiny. Um, I understand between negative and affirmative orders, uh, there is a difference as to when and how they come into effect, but I'm completely unaware of any constraints on how Parliament may uh, scrutinise one or the other. And I just wonder what uh, constraints uh, Isabel was identifying that prevent us from uh, scrutinising uh, negative orders in the same way we scrutinise affirmative orders. I've successfully opposed uh, negative orders in opposition. Isabel, would you like to come in? Hi, uh, yeah, thanks, Stuart, and uh, apologies if I wasn't entirely clear in my answer previously. I was, ma I was mainly referring to the fact that uh, although there are different so there are exemptions to where some of the regulations would be uh, subject to the affirmative procedure and where some would be subject to the negative procedure, that um, because there's not clarity about why those powers would be used, as I said, in order to achieve high environmental outcomes, or because the powers are discretionary and do not necessitate ministers to um, follow changes in EU uh, law if they do not choose to, that, that, was the, uh, that was what I was principally trying to get across, so apologize if, apologies if that was not clear. I would also just like to come back in on a point that uh, Dr. Vivian Gravy just made. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with what she was just saying about the kind of informal processes and ability to continue to engage with the development of EU environmental protections. And I would just agree that that will continue to be extremely important. And it just shows the kind of importance of maintaining those informal processes and engagement as we move forward. Thank you, Stuart. Would you like to continue your questions around uh, common frameworks, please? Uh, thank you, Convena. Yes, um, the, the, the common frameworks are uh, obviously uh, going to sit around everything that uh, might be done on this uh, uh, under this bill if it becomes a, 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 an act. Um, and I just wondered uh, if the, the, the members have concerns about how we should get to those common frameworks, because clearly. Um, there is an agreement between all the administrations in the UK that common frameworks should exist. Um, that's really not uh, not a matter of contention at all. Uh, but the, but but it's not going to be a process for producing them uh, that reflects the needs, aspirations, and room for flexibility in certain areas. Um, in in fishing, for example, in my other one of my other committees, we'll be discussing the, the, the fishing fisheries bill at Westminster uh, tomorrow, and that looks like a piece of good cooperation where it's probably working well. But in other areas, it's it's less certain. And I just wondered, uh, in particular, perhaps starting with Vivian uh, Gravy, if we can, uh, because of her focus on Brexit, and hence perhaps on this, if if I could get some feedback on the whole issue of common frameworks and how they should be created and what constraints uh, they might might create. And that's all I want to ask Convina, so I'll listen carefully to the answer. Thank you. So if we go to Dr. Gravy first. Okay. So common frameworks, it's a process that has been very long uh, in coming, right? We have had uh, proposals from common framework, uh, the agreement in principle in October 2017. Um, and there, there was already a lot of flexibility. You know, common frameworks could be everything from just a political agreement to a legal agreement 
to common standards, to just common objectives. And what we're seeing is actually very little that has been confirmed. Uh, we have only, um, you know, only a few uh, common frameworks will actually be in place uh, by the end of December, and we're going to have a lot of um, provisional frameworks in other areas. So we've had a lot of work behind the scenes between officials of the four administrations on these common frameworks, but they are very uh, difficult. Like they're, you know, they're very specific to key issues such as hazardous substances, uh, radioactive substances, or the emission trading systems. And these are very important elements of environmental rules, but they are not, they're not, you know, we're missing the glue um, and all the issues and you know, all the horizontal issues. And that's why there is some value to the discussion, but of course, around the UK internal market. But the biggest missing piece of that jigsaw is the reform of the intergovernmental relations uh, between uh, you know, how the actual Four Nations UK work. Because one of the key issues with the common frameworks, as you rightly pointed out, is how are they actually agreed? And what's happening if one of the Four Nations stops uh, abiding by the common framework? What's, uh, you, what are the procedures to make sure that these frameworks are updated, are implemented, and if there's any tensions between the Four Nations? And for now, we are having a lot, but slow but steady progress on some of the technical aspects of these common frameworks, but we're missing a lot, or at least it's happening behind closed doors and we're not hearing about it, what's happening in terms of the governance of these common frameworks. And that's where we have, you know, in many ways, a, a process that is completely in the other direction than what we had at the EU level, where we first had rules on how we do policies together, how we implement them, and then we decide on policies. And here what we're having is we're starting with common policies and we're trying to figure out the rules on how to agree them and how to implement them afterward. And that's a weird way of proceeding. Thank you. Alison McNabb. Thank you, convener. I think um, Dr. Gravy's highlighted that um, we're, we're coming up to the three-year mark um, since we, we started out on the, the common framework arrangements. And it appears on the face of it that um, we're, we're not going to be in a position where a significant number of common frameworks at least are agreed by the end of the, the transition period at the end of this year. I think the, the Scottish Government's um, response to the internal market white paper last week indicated that six um, common frameworks will be fully developed by the end of this year with um, a number, I think, 25 or so, um, will be provisionally um, provi provisionally agreed sometime after um, 2020. Um, 21 policy areas have been identified as being subject to more detailed discussion as to whether legislative common frameworks are required. A number of those concern environmental matters. And as Dr. Gravy has indicated, um, while there appears to be work going on behind closed doors and between officials and, and perhaps between ministers in this regard, uh, there isn't much um, by way of outward facing um, detail or, or material so far. And I think consultation with those, um, particularly those who will be affected by these frameworks, operating in, in environmental and other markets will be will be really key to their success. Um, I think also the governance of, of frameworks is an interesting issue. Um, Mr. Stevenson referred to the, the fisheries bill. That is a good example of a, a common framework where, um, on the face of it, things seem to be um, generally quite well agreed. Um, but of course, there is no provision in the bill for what happens if a joint fisheries statement cannot be agreed by the, the respective authorities. So there may need to be some further consideration as to, to what will happen in circumstances where agreement cannot be reached or there is some kind of dispute. And I'll come to Isabel Mercer. Thanks, convener. Um, so I think the points on this that have been made already are excellent. I would add, just add two quick um, supplementary points. One, just about stakeholder engagement with the development of common frameworks. So we understand that that is kind of the next phase. So phase three of the cabinet office process for developing common frameworks is to reach out and, uh, and engage in a process of stakeholder consultation on those. Um, that hasn't really happened yet with most of the common frameworks. So we're quite keen to ensure that that does happen and there's transparency in that process. 
And then a second point is just that in terms of the areas and that common frameworks being developed in, our understanding again is that um, nature conservation type issues, so actually looking at protection of species and habitats or essentially things like cross-border protected areas, migratory species, are currently falling out with of some of the um, analysis of the areas where formal common frameworks are going to have to be agreed. So I think that's definitely an area where some greater clarity about um, arrangements moving forward would be much appreciated and very important. Uh, thank you. Um, Finn Carson wants to have a, a very quick supplementary before I move on to Angus MacDonald. Finn. Thanks, Kavira. Just, just a very, very quick one. What, what do, you, do the panel think the, the issue is with getting these common frameworks together? Is it just simply that some of them are very complicated? We have heard the fisheries one is, is progressing well, but what is behind the, the, the lack of progress with the other common framework uh, work? If anyone has a view on that, um, please indicate. I guess it's a bit speculative uh, without actually knowing what was on. No one seems to want to, to come in on that. Okay, I'm going to move on to questions from Angus MacDonald. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Angus, oh. just stop me. Dr. Gravy said that she would like to answer Finn's question. But I agree. I think it is part of it is really the complexity, but it's also the uncertainty. I mean, we've had uh, a number of uh, civil servants working on uh, common frameworks that had to, you know, start working more on no deal preparation and then being put back um, on, you know, common frameworks and going back and forth. And of course, now with COVID, we've had a lot of strain put on uh, on, gov on government officials in the respective ministries. And so, if you add to that the fact that, of course, ministries like DEFRA were completely understaffed at the, at the time of the referendum, had lost by two thirds of their staff since 2005, you have a huge strain on civil service. It is much harder to you know, unpick and decide what to keep uh, out of EU um, rules than it was actually to go into the EU and to start negotiating rules together. Thank you very much for that. Um, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, the the CUM panel will have heard me ask the, the the previous panel about the reciprocal and related proposals which have been uh, proposed through the the UK Environment Bill. Um, and I wonder if uh, you would care to compare the UK government and Scottish government proposals, especially around whether uh, there are areas where the UK Environment Bill is stronger or better refined uh, um, or better defined. Uh, than the Scottish proposals, and if there are such areas, um, if you could discuss what the implications uh, may be. Isabel Mercer. Thanks, convener. Thanks, Angus. I think that's an excellent question, and I think there were some really good responses to that in the previous panel, actually, um, where actually uh, Professor Scottford also highlighted that in some ways it's quite difficult to pair, compare the two pieces of legislation because they've had quite different objectives and scope in terms of the types of things that are included. However, I would also reiterate the points, the excellent points that were made about um, environmental improvement plans and targets. So that's certainly something that Scottish Environment Link would like to see as a commitment to bring forward at least future legislation that includes binding nature recovery targets and would place the um, environment strategy on statutory footing and that those two things would actually be linked as well on the face of a bill. If it's not in this one, we would quite like to see a commitment in this bill to bring forward that legislation at a future date. So what I would just add to that is thinking about um, Professor Campbell Gemmell's comments as well about the fact that this is a system of, you know, it's a framework that allows high environmental outcomes to be achieved, which is made up of legislation, policy and governance mechanisms. And whilst this bill does some good things that it plugs gaps in certain places and it puts Scotland on a good pathway. There are other pieces of the jigsaw that are missing that would allow Scotland to be more of an environmental world leader and play that kind of leading role in tackling the climate and nature emergencies, which we know is so urgently needed, um, and targets principally being one of those. Dr. Bravey? Yes, so I think looking at the two. Um, uh, the two regulators, we can see where in some areas um, environmental standards Scotland is better, some areas as bad, and some areas worse. 
um, than the OEP. So in terms of better, what we're seeing is that there are more uh, direct enforcement powers in the Scottish approach. And the principles themselves have to be headed by uh, ministers and public authorities, not just a guidance on these principles. Um, it is slightly better as well in terms of independence, although that's not perfect, and I'm sure we'll, we'll cover that as well. Where it is as bad is actually in removing environmental um, information from the remit of environmental law. That is something that for a continuity bill that says it builds on the EU's approach goes completely against the EU's approach, where environmental access to environmental ac information, access to environmental justice is not just in the OWIS Convention, it's also part of the EU ECI. Um, where it is worse is in that I have regard to the principles. It's something we've had so many discussions in the environmental bill um, in, in Westminster that I would have hoped it would have been picked up uh, by people drafting the bill in Scotland. Have regard is not strong enough um, for the principles. There is also no climate change. Um, the climate change is out um, with the remit, and that's, that's problematic. Uh, we've again had a lot of discussion on that in Westminster. Um, moving after the Westminster Bill, in many ways, you, you had you know the opportunities to learn from a lot of the mistakes done in England and to do it better. It has been done in some areas and not other than finally, uh, as Eloise Scottford mentioned in the previous panel, the lack of the integration principle. So to conclude very quickly, yes, there are very different bills. Okay, so we we know that there is no uh, advisory role, for example, for the ESS, and there's no uh, big uh, you know environmental strategy with legal. Um, legal basis here. So that is something that perhaps is again something that you can do in another bill, uh, but it definitely will need to be done in, in order for Scotland to kind of remain ahead of the game in terms of environmental ambition across the UK. Thank you. Alison McNabb. Thank you. I think um, there's probably not much more that I need to comment in relation to the, the principles that hasn't already been addressed by, by other panel members, both here and in the, the earlier session today. In relation to um, environmental governance and, and ESS, um, I, I think there are, are clearly some similarities between ESS and the, the provisions in the UK bill around the, the OEP. But what is clear is that there are opportunities for strengthening what is there, both in terms of independence and um, in terms of the resourcing matters as well, um, funding particularly. Um, and I think largely the devil will be in the detail as to, to how the body operates, how its strategy is set um, under the, the provisions of Schedule 2 of the bill. So um, I think to some extent it's a, another kind of wait and see matter, um, but certainly some opportunities to, to strengthen the provisions there. And Isabel Mercer wanted to come back in. Thanks, convener. Um, it was just to pick up on one of the points that Dr. Gravy made about the principal's duty. So I was just going to agree that we feel quite strongly that the the framing of the duty does need to be strengthened. And actually, various committees um, at Westminster, so House of Lords Select Committee, when it was investigating the effectiveness of the biodiversity duty in England, found that the wording have regard to was quite weak and ineffective. And there have been many discussions around this, as I know, and, and as Dr. Gravy already pointed out at the UK level. But at a minimum, we feel that should be strengthened to have due regard or have special regard to the principles. But actually, to go much stronger, it could be something like act in accordance with the principles. Thank you. And continuing on the principles theme, um, Mark Ruskell has some questions. Yeah, I, I think um, the panelists have, have maybe touched on on some aspects of, of the principles discussion there, um, reflecting on the other panel. But I just wanted to ask if you had anything more to say specifically about the principle of integration and also the principle of the high level of environmental protection. If you would like to come to Dr. Gravy first. I think I just want to say I, I completely support the discussion that's been had in the first panel. We need both um, high environmental ambition and um, integration added in. In terms of continuity, that would be the very least. I think then there, there was a debate when we were first talking about principles a few years back already in this Brexit process around whether this was actually an opportunity to 
increase the number of principles and to look at your uh, like international environmental law. Um, and there, I think there's questions around avoiding transboundary harm. That is something that I think should definitely be there if we're thinking of Four Nations UK and making sure that, but that should not be just for the Scottish uh, bill, but also across the UK, that if there's divergence, we should make sure that divergence does not cost our neighbours. Thank you. Alison McNabb. Thank you, convener. I think um, what is, is going to be key here is the, the detail which is provided in the guidance on the, the environmental principles which will be brought forward in due course. Um, there are, of course, a, a significant number of principles within an EU law, not just principally relating to the environment, but in a number of other areas as well. And it will be important that the guidance clearly sets out um, how the environmental principles in the bill are to sit alongside and um, kind of work with or be interpreted alongside um, the other other principles in EU law um, as well. So I think I think that will really be key. Um, we will perhaps come on further to, to discuss the have regard to um, requirement in relation to the principles. There is, of course, um, some precedent in, in that established practice requiring ministers to, to have regard to matters. It will, to some extent, help to ensure environmental um, concerns are taken into account when, when decisions are being made, but equally is limited. Um, you could have regard to something, but in fact attach very little or, or no weight to it. So it is by its nature um, limited in scope. A high level environmental um, environmental aim or, or, or goal um, would help to, to strengthen the, the provisions on environmental protection and that may be maybe one of the other options which could be taken. Mark, do you have any other questions on this? We we have covered principles quite a lot. Mm. And yeah, I've got some later questions, but yeah. No, can, well, um, can, carry on, Mark, with your, your, your later questions. Is it, is it on principles or, or beyond? Well, it's on the scope aspect. But yeah. yeah, carry on. Okay. Um, well, uh, you might have seen it at the end of the fir first panel. Um, I was asking a range of questions there about the scope of the bill. Um, I mean, it, it is quite kind of wedded to strategic environment assessment looking at plans and programmes in, in particular rather than individual decisions. Do you have do you have reflections on that? If panelists would like to indicate who'd like to come in on, on, on that. If anyone. Alison? Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to come in briefly on, on Mr. Ruskell's point. I think, um, as noted in the, the earlier panel, the, the provisions around um, essentially not dealing with individual cases, um, of course, mean that the, the um, provisions in the bill are not entirely in line with the current provisions under um, the EU arrangements. Um, there are, I suppose, arguments for and against um, as to whether um, a kind of dealing with individual cases um, or, or taking a more of a strategic approach um, may, be, may be of benefit. Um, but I think, I think what is to an extent um, important here are the provisions to be able to um, take steps, um, both in terms of improvement reports, compliance um, notices, etc., and also the, the judicial review proceedings um, to be able to, to action um, where there has been a, an alleged failure in, in terms of environmental law. And, and those provisions will be key. There is some degree of strength in those um, in that there is a compared, for example, to the UK bill, um, direct enforcement powers the provision to, to take matters back to the court of session um, where, where a notice has not been complied with um, is, is hopefully um, brings a, a fairly kind of strong power in terms of compelling compliance. So um, I, think, I think that will be important. But of course, it is significant that um, ESS has sufficient teeth really to be able to, to um, 
properly take action where necessary. Um, Isabel Mercer. Thanks, convener. <clears throat> yeah, I think this, uh, this uh, point about whether the ESS powers and remit cover individual decisions is a, a really important one. And I would agree with a lot of the comments that have been made so far that uh, as drafted the provisions in the bill and, and this exemption does not it, it um, does not achieve equivalence with current arrangements under the EU. It's not entirely clear why some of the powers are exempt individual decisions and others don't. So my reading of the bill is that a citizen or an NGO, for instance, could submit a complaint about a failure to um, apply law regarding an individual decision to the body and that it could uh, request information um, and potentially try to resolve that issue in a more informal manner, but it then could not issue an improvement report or a compliance notice. But then it could apply for judicial review regarding, individ um, regarding individual decisions where it feels that there's been a, se a serious failure uh, to um, comply with the law or where they feel um, serious harm might be made to the environment. So it's not quite clear why that middle portion of um, enforcement powers is exempt from that and the, and the other two ends of the spectrum are not. And to my mind, that would then potentially actually increase pressure on the court system, because if there were um, representations coming forward from the public uh, regarding individual decisions that they felt there was quite a se serious implications for the environment, um, that, that I think there's an outstanding question whether that could then increase the amount of times that the body would uh, apply for judi judicial review. Um, and that, uh, in general, whilst Scottish Environment Link supports the kind of function and remit of the body in looking at systemic issues and systemic failures, and that absolutely makes sense in fitting with the existing governance framework in Scotland, the exemption of individual decisions does kind of um, overlook the really critical role that individual decisions have played in a precedent setting in the past. So. There's been um, various landmark cases involving individual cases um, at the Court of Justice and the European Commission that have set really important precedents for how, for instance, the Birds and Habitats directives are interpreted and applied across member states. Thank you. And Dr. Groovy? Just to add quickly to these great points, um, I think it's all about being able to review the powers as well, and perhaps start actually with with uh, with a bit of a wider understanding, and to actually allow individual cases. And then once uh, once the ESS is up and running for a longer time, then it will be easier to focus on um, on the more systemic cases. But it is better, I think, to start with a very wide scope, and then potentially um, you know take and I make it uh, smaller gradually than actually to end up with a brand new regulator that could end up not being able to address the key problems of today. Uh, Claudia, we just want to come in, but um, Claudia, before I come to you, I know that Isabel Mercer has just put uh, another request to come in, but on the back of what Dr. Gravy has said. Isabel, I'll come to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Convener. It was just to add another very quick point, building on um, Dr. Gravy's uh, point there is that um, we wonder if there could be some form of sifting or um, sifting mechanism so that the body would not become overloaded with individual decisions. So there should be some sort of screening. Pro if, if the remit was widened, then there could be some sort of screening process to ensure that um, lots and lots of individual cases that didn't potentially have significant environmental implications were not taken on. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. And I'd like to ask um, a, an additional question about the um, environmental principles um, and then move to the, um, the issue of having due regard to or, or going further than that on the principles. Um, and I highlighted with the previous panel um, the Faculty of Advocates um, uh, submission where they highlight that there's no mention made of environmental equity in a redistributive um, this was highlighted that it might not be a principle by one of the panel members. Um, so I'm wondering about um, what the, uh, addressing the issue of human health and in the environmental context and also worldwide environmental problems and equity. If, if the panel could comment on that and also on if there are any further comments to make um, in terms of 
either having due regard to or regard to or to having to act in accordance with. And I and I note that um, Dr. Grave has already commented that that, that um, as drafted, she doesn't believe it's strong enough, if I got that right. Uh, so I'd value comments on that and whether there might be um, those from any of the panel members. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, I'll, I'll take our panellists in turn if you, um, if anyone wants to go first. I'll come to Alison first. Thank you, convener. I think on the, the point around the, the additional principles mentioned by the, the Faculty of Advocates, I suppose that goes back to my earlier comment that um, there are, are a number of principles in EU law which um, require some consideration, and the guidance is probably the key to addressing how the, the environmental principles within the bill are to be balanced um, and uh, interpreted alongside the wide range of, of other matters, um, both other principles, but also existing substantive law um, and duties, for example, in relation to, to climate change and biodiversity, etc., as well. Um, so I think um, I think that's probably the the key to to that point. In terms of the the have regard to duty, I think I've probably um, already covered off comments on that. Thank you, Dr. Gravy. Thank you. I think in terms of equity, the big issue there is um, the fact that financial matters and budgets that uh, are not covered in the scope of the bill. Uh, for the environmental principles. So, in terms of building back better, green recovery, all of these very important debates, you omit, you know, the bill is currently not um, helping in that direction. But more generally, I think it goes to show that what we're doing is actually quite impressive that we're talking so much about environmental principles. These principles, precautionary principles especially, they're not just environmental principles, they're general principles. Um, and what we're talking about is plugging this environmental governance gap, perhaps forgetting that actually these principles play a huge role, for, for example, for public health. Um, and so that is quite worrying. And I think Professor uh, Scottford picked up on this in the first panel, that we're talking about the um, precautionary principle when it comes to the environment. This is a wider principle. And we need to be careful in how we are copy pasting from the EU that we're not just actually narrowing the scope of these principles to just being narrowly environmental when actually they infuse the whole of the environment like the whole of the EU uh, body of legislation. Thank you. We're going to move on to a further question from Mark Ruskell. Um, I think that last answer partly partly covered it actually convener but the others may have uh, views about the issue of, of exclusions, and in particular the, um, the, the exclusion of financial budgets. Um, I do remember this was a discussion when the original strategic environmental assessment legislation was going through Parliament, and I think the debate was around, well, if you've got a plan or program that already captures policies, why do you need to include financial budgeting within that? But you know that was 15 years ago, so I'd, I'm interested in, in other views on on where financial budgeting sits at the moment, whether it, whether it should be an exclusion in this bill or, or not. I'll go to Isabel Mercer. Thanks. I think it's an extremely interesting and relevant question, uh, particularly in the current context of talking about green recovery from the coronavirus crisis. Um, we obviously extremely welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has committed to that. Um, but I think it does then raise questions about whether um, through the budget process, these principles should be applied. And thinking that a number of them are very relevant, um, particularly pre preventative principles. So thinking about the cost of uh, cleaning up uh, once environmental harm has happened, rather than uh, spending upfront on prevention, particularly applies to things like spread of invasive non-native species, where uh, the cost of implementing biosecurity measures um, far is far, far, far less than um, cleaning up once the, the, those species have spread throughout Scotland. So I think it's a very relevant question. Thank you. And Alison McNabb? Thank you, Convener. I think this is a matter in which um, would require some, some greater clarity. Um, it appears from the, the face of the bill that there is essentially a, a blanket exclusion in relation to, to financial and budgetary matters. 
my understanding from Scottish Government is that um, the intention is that this applies, that this exclusion only applies to matters that are exclusively um, financial or budgetary. Um, but I think that's something that we need further clarification on. As Isabel says, there appears to be um, perhaps some disconnect with this um, uh, overall exclusion and the discussion about the importance of a, a green recovery um, and a green economy, particularly in the context of um, COVID-19. Thank you. We're going to move on to talk about, um, I'll ask you for your thoughts on the purpose of the bill, specifically around the proposed um, Environmental Standards Scotland. And I'll go to questions from Angus MacDonald. Basically, to uh, ask the panel if um, if they would say that the bill through the proposed DSS it provides for a continuity of governance after Brexit, and if not, where would the the gaps be? And also, uh, if the panel members would say the bill's proposals and ESS model. Uh, is the most effective solution? Alison McNabb. Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to come in on that. I think I've already um, made reference this morning to the fact that individual cases have um, somewhat of a, a limited role in, um, in the ESS um, functioning. And that is, of course, um, means that the, the arrangements under ESS will not be fully comparable with the current EU arrangements. I think in terms of um, whether ESS is a, a good model um, compared to, to what other options may have been, um, I think having matters dealt with by a single body brings um, certain advantages over the possibility of um, separating out and, and almost giving additional powers to existing bodies. There are opportunities to strengthen the ESS model, particularly in terms of independence, um, both membership and funding, and I think um, that would really help to, to strengthen the, the provision um, and be almost more comparable to the current EU model, which of course has um, some degree of a, a more arm's length approach. Isabel Mercer. Thanks, convener. Yeah, so I would agree with Alison that the two main issues that stand out in terms of um, not, not achieving equivalence with current EU arrangements are the independence and the um, exemption of individual cases from uh, various of the body's powers. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that, and I can't. I think he mentioned it earlier that Link commissioned some quite uh, extensive research from Professor Campbell Gemmell, um, and the outcome of that was to advocate for a parliamentary commission model. So it's worth saying that this model, as drafted, does fall short of Link's hopes for the bill. Um, however, we do think that in general the kind of functions and most of the powers given to the body are quite sensible and do uh, largely match some of the functions that are currently uh, carried out by EU bodies. I think there's a longer term question as well about an outstanding question around environmental courts in Scotland, which, um, as the committee knows, has been quite a live debate over many years. Um, and Campbell Gemmell's report um, did actually set out that even with a parliamentary commission model or a kind of, as we call it, a watchdog model, which this um, environmental standard Scotland goes some way towards achieving, uh, it does really ultimately need a, a dedicated environment court to work alongside it, um, which would address kind of uh, some of the issues around access to justice in Scotland and the fact that the judicial review process can only look at um, issues from quite a, a narrow procedural uh, perspective rather than the kind of merits-based argument that the Court of Justice can look at. Um, so as it stands, we feel that, yes, a couple of um, strengthening provisions need to be added to the bill, uh, particularly in terms of independence and uh, yeah, the exemption around individual decisions. But Link would also like to see in the future an, a dedicated environment court uh, in Scotland to work alongside the ESS. And we feel that that would create a really strong platform of environmental governance to help Scotland to um, be a world leader in achieving uh, high environmental standards. I'm going to come to, to Dr. Gravy, but I'm going to throw this into the mix as well, because the um, uh, discussions around the role of the ESS when it comes to international law 
and agreements that the UK government is a signatory on. Where do you think the, the ESS should sit there? Should it have any locus in that uh, at all? But I'll go to Vivian Gravy and, and let you sort of think think about about that aspect of things as well. I might come back to our other panel members. Dr. Gravy. I think the first point is to remember that what the ESS is trying to replace, as in the Commission, the Court of Justice, are not environmental regulators. They're general regulators. They cover the whole remit of public policy, all of the EU competence. Um, and that means that there's going to be cases that perhaps would have been picked up by the Court of Justice and the Commission, where there's some environmental element, but it's not the core of the matter that won't necessarily be picked up by the ESS. Um, if we look back at the internal market, you could have you know, cases where we have environment on one hand and internal market rules on the other would make perfect sense to uh, go through the Commission and Court of Justice, might not go through the ESS. Um, and so the, we are not replacing like for like, um, and not just in terms of independence, but of course, I mean, we cannot have similar, the only way we would have had similar levels of independence if we had had a four nations regulator with members and funding coming from all part of the UK, which meant that neither um, of the governments could actually uh, limit the powers of, uh, of the body. This is not the direction we're going into. But as um, the previous panel showed, that we then have issues around the use, you know, UK governments uh, using de like acting in default areas and vice versa, where this falls through the gap. So I think there's a question there of, in terms of patching these gaps, do we still need some kind of UK-wide level on top of the OEP for England and Northern Ireland and the ESS and the future proposal in Wales? Uh, to deal with these cross-border issues, to deal with these moments where we have uh, ministers acting in the other's competences. So it's not like for like, and we still have lots of gaps, but in many ways the ESS is stronger than the OEP for both England uh, and Northern Ireland. Claudia Beamish wanted to come in. Well, yeah. uh, thank you, Kavina. Thank you. Um, I, I've actually got a question for um, Isabel on, in relation to how, um, in, in as briefly as possible at this stage, uh, uh, you would see the, um, the ESS and the environmental courts working in parallel, and if that could um, cause confusions and difficulties, perhaps. Although I've, I've been involved in that discussion along with many others for, for many years. And then um, also, um, in relation to the independence more widely for the panel um, of the um, future ESS, um, as, as I asked the last panel, do you see that um, the fact that Scottish ministers um, are involved in making the appointments to the interim body, um, uh, would this in, in any way jeopardise the independence, do you see, and that it may um, then um, be the temptation to proceed to the next stage with, with those who are already in place or, or um, similar um, uh, challenges, perhaps? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so on the point of the environmental court, I would see it operating maybe just insofar as the cases where um, the ESS is perceived where there's a serious failure to comply or there's a case where there's a potential or there is serious harm to the environment, then rather than necessarily applying for judicial review, there might be an alternative process involving the uh, environmental court where um, they could apply instead to that court for a merits-based review of the case rather than a procedural review. So I hope that um, clarifies some of the committee members' uh, questions on that matter. Just on the uh, independence process, some of the ways that um, Link thinks that the independence could potentially be strengthened is a role for a parliamentary committee potentially to um, identify uh, areas of expertise that they think should be covered by the board and um, potentially also to appoint rapporteurs to then um, aid in the appointments process. So at, at a minimum, we feel there should potentially be more parliamentary involvement in the appointments process in order to improve the independence. Um, and it, it, that they're just some ideas for how that could potentially be carried out. Claudia, do you want to come back in on that? Or? Yes. Thank you, Convener. Um, could, could I just ask you about um, then what 
what sorts of powers you would see that the environmental courts would have, um, rather than just highlighting issues that of importance. Thank you. And so I think Alison wanted to come in, so I'll uh, I'll go to Isabel first, and then I'll bring Alison in. Isabel. Sorry, convener. Yeah, so just on that point, it was more just about the ability of a dedicated environment courts um, to undertake merits based arguments, merits based reviews, rather than just simply looking at the procedural issues. Um, so by having, for instance, dedicated specialist uh, experts and technical staff, uh, environmental courts tend to be better equipped to deal with the sorts of uh, technical issues that can come up in environmental cases. Um, and it's worth highlighting as well that the court, as I think has been highlighted earlier, the Court of Justice currently can undertake merits-based reviews of whether, for instance, um, the interpretation of a piece of environmental legislation, whereas judicial review is more narrow in looking at whether the process or procedure itself has been uh, carried out within the law. Um, Alice McNabb. Thank you, convener. Just to come in on um, the second issue around independence and, and particularly membership of the body, um, Isabel's already referred to one potential option to, to strengthen the provisions in this area. Others may be to provide a, a, a fixed term for membership on the face of the bill and um, to, to strengthen the provisions around um, consultation where a member um, may be removed from the body. On the, the interim arrangements as such, um, I think we're probably in a scenario where um, hands are a little bit tied, given that um, the, the timing in which this bill is, is being brought forward is likely to mean that there will be um, some period of time, at least in the early part of next year, before Environmental Standards Scotland as a um, statutory body can be established. So, to some extent, um, I, I think there may be scope for, for strengthening the arrangements there, but it is probably a natural consequence of, of simply the timing that it means that the interim members appointed to the non-statutory body um, will, will feed into the, the statutory body at such time as that is established. I think that is probably a better solution than having um, a gap of time which is, is not filled by the body. But there may be some, um, albeit not statutory, but some means by which the Parliament can engage in the, the process to ensure that that is as robust as possible. Thank you. Um, Mark Ruskell wanted to come in with a quick question. Um. Do you see ESS having a role in terms of climate change? We've obviously got a UK Climate Change Committee. Dr Gravy? Yes, um, so we know from uh, that the UK Climate Change Committee in the um, Westminster um, discussions on the environmental bill has suggested that they, they thought it didn't make sense for the OEP not to have remit over climate change and that any potential overlaps could be dealt with by the two regulators talking together. Um, and I think that's if it works, if the UK Climate Change Committee can talk with the OEP to figure it out, it can do with the ESS. And I think it would be extremely odd, especially for something with such transpandary um, you know, impact such as climate change, that it would be covered by the OEP, but would not be covered by the ESS. And Isabel Mercer. Thanks. I would agree with that. And I think it also just comes back to some of the points that were made earlier around the definition of environmental law in the bill. And um, so I would re re reiterate some of the points that have already been made that we feel that's quite narrow at the moment and that the definite the or whose definition which is in the environmental information scotland regulations would be a preferable definition to use um and i would agree with the points that um hopefully some sort of sufficient working arrangement between the ccc and the ess could be achieved um that would mean that that exemption uh, on climate change could be removed from the bill when it comes to Angus MacDonald, um, to sort of expand this about potential gaps between the two agencies, Angus. Yes, yeah, thanks. Um, we, we've heard from the Law Society of Scotland, which presumably uh, was authored by Alison, 
um, which has referred to um, as a potential lacuna to, in environmental governance, and that an action uh, Scottish ministers take using an executive devolved power in a reserve policy area would be excluded from the remit of the ESS, whilst UK ministers exercising powers and devolved competence would be excluded from the remit of the OEP. So, can I ask if, um, if the, the panel envisage if UK ministers exercising powers and devolved competence and Scottish ministers exercising executive powers and reserved competence uh, are out with the remits of both uh, the OEP and the ESS? Uh, perhaps Alison would be the best one to start. Alison? Thank you. Uh, Mr MacDonald, I'm not sure I can claim um, credit for all of the, the lost cited submission, but certainly um, uh, Clearly, we have we have made comments in regard to the the po potential gaps here. Um, I think this this is of concern. Clearly, in order for the the system to operate fully, it needs to be able to cover all matters. And um, at least on the on the face of it, it appears that that these two issues um, are 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 currently um, not covered by either ESS or the OEP. It may be that these are matters which um, you know simply need to be resolved further down the line. But I think um, the point was made in the earlier panel, and this is something that I certainly would agree with, that um, for citizens making complaints to these bodies, it is going to be crucial that um, the bodies can sufficiently um, work together to make sure that um, something which is, is passed to one, but in fact um, is really within the remit of the other, can be can be passed over and dealt with accordingly. And can I come to Dr. Gravy? Yes, just quickly. Um, I think the transboundary aspects again. Uh, you know, if we end up having a decision in Scotland that would actually have a, the action of a public authority in Scotland that would have negative environmental impact on, you know, in England or vice versa, we need to make sure again that there is good communication between the two um, regulators so that these kind of transboundary harm are uh, mitigated against. Thank you. And now to uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, touched on um, enforcement powers, and I'd like to um, explore, ask the panel to give further comments on on those for the ESS or the proposed ESS actions um, uh, in relation to the compliance notice and improvement report. Are these sufficient for an effective environmental governance body? Um, and if not, what what would you like to see? Thank you. Thank you. So we have touched on this, but we could expand on on this. Alison? Thank you, convener. Um, I think just to make two brief points in this regard, um, both in relation to improvement reports and compliance notices, there are powers within the bill um, to um, take forward um, essentially a, Intimation to the court of session um, to to report on uh, a failure to comply, and I think that will assist in um, compelling compelling compliance. In relation to improvement reports, particularly, I think there would be benefit here in clearer reporting requirements, so as to monitor. Um, how the, the improvement plan is being implemented, and that would would particularly strengthen the provisions there. You. And Isabel? Thanks, Convener. Just briefly, because I think we've probably covered um, some of these issues sufficiently. Um, largely, we feel that those powers are sufficient if the exemption on um, individual decisions was removed. Um, other than that, I think that it does kind of create a, a sort of tiered approach that largely, in some ways, does replicate the current process we have with the um, EU Commission infringement process. And, what we do know from that um, existing process is that the deterrent effect of kind of a range of enforcement powers that get stronger with the ultimate backstop of um, you know, a, a, the EU situation um, 
recourse to the Court of Justice, but in this instance, either to um, the Court of Session if a compliance notice or an improvement report was not complied with, or um, to application for judicial review in serious cases, does work in um, helping to resolve issues early on in the process. So I think that's quite a good feature of the bill. Claudia, are you happy with, with that? We probably have um, time for Mark Ruskell to ask the question that we perhaps we skipped over as we were talking about principles. Mark, would you like to ask it now as our final question to the panel? Yeah, thank, thanks, Kavina. Um, it, it's about the definition of the environment um, within the bill. You know, we've already talked about climate change, but I'm aware that the current definition doesn't include plants and animals, which seems a bit odd. But what what are your your reflections on on that definition at the moment. Can I come to Isabel because you were nodding while Mark was saying that, so I'm going to come to you. No problem. I'm happy to come in on that point, convener. Yeah. So just to reiterate my earlier point, um, we do think that there are some issues with the definition of environment and environmental law currently in the bill, and would like to see the um, definition of the Aarhus. The Aarhus definition, which is in the Environmental Information Regulations, but I would agree with Mr. Ruskell's point that um, uh, animals, plants, and other living organisms and biodiversity and ecosystems are included when defining environmental harm, but then are not included when in defining environmental law. So that potentially is just an oversight in the drafting um, and something we'd quite like to seek further clarity on. Okay, thank you. Right, we, we've asked you many questions. We thank you very much for the time you spent with us this morning. It's been very useful to us. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll end this session here and concludes the public part of our meeting today. Our next meeting on the 25th of August will be taking further evidence on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Bill, but we're now going to suspend and go into private session. Thank you.